All right. Good afternoon, everyone. As part of her visit to Brazil, the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohamed, will today travel to Santarém in the state of Pará in the Amazon region. On the first two days of her trip to the country, the Deputy Secretary General and her delegation had a number of meetings with the federal government in Brasilia, including with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mauro Luiz Vera, the Minister of the General Secretariat of the Presidency, Marcio Macedo, the Minister of the Environment and Climate, Marina Silva, and the Special Advisor to the President for International Affairs, Celso Amorim. She also met senior officials representing the Ministries of Financing and Planning, amongst others. Ms. Mohammed commended the government's efforts to strengthen the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and discussed the importance of raising ambition at the global stage for the 2030 Agenda, climate action, and reforming of the international financial system. The Deputy Secretary General also engaged with the President of, of the Senate, Rodrigo Pacheco, and with the representatives of ABDE, the Brazilian, the Brazilian Development Financial Institutions. Ms. Mohamed also met with the UN country team on the organization's collaboration with the Brazilian government to achieve the SDGs. On Niger, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and its partners remain committed to delivering assistance to the most vulnerable people in the country. Humanitarian operations continue uninterrupted and road movements are possible and have been authorized. On Monday, the UN Humanitarian Air Service, UNHAS, organized special flights to Diffa, Dawa, and Agadez to transport staff from the UN and our partners following authorization previously obtained by the transitional authorities. As you'll recall, some 4.3 million people in Niger, the vast majority of whom are women and children, need humanitarian aid. OCHA stresses that all parties must continue to respect humanitarian principles and allow for unhindered access for humanitarian workers to all people in need across the country. At a press conference in Kinshasa today, the head of our peacekeeping mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bintu Keita, highlighted the challenges ahead for MONUSCO's transition, including the significant insecurity that still plagues 13 territories in North Kivu, South Kivu, and in Turi, the provinces where the mission is still present and which require sustained joint action by national security forces and UN peacekeepers. Ms. Geta described 2024 as the year of transition, where the mission will increasingly transfer its responsibilities, including the protection of civilians, to the government of the DRC. In that regard, MONUSCO is working closely with authorities to ensure that national capacities meet minimum security requirements to allow for a responsible drawdown of the mission. The expertise and resources of the UN family are also being leveraged to help the government implement national plans to support humanitarian needs and development. We have an update from Mali, where more than 460 peacekeepers from MINUSMA's Egyptian Combat and Convoy Escort Battalion have left the town of Gao in the country's northern part. For more than a year, they operated in a difficult environment, escorting convoys from Gao to Tessalit via Kidal and Agalhok, under constant threat from improvised explosive devices by armed groups. Their work contributed to safe passage for logistical convoys and helped to protect civilians. The departure of the, of the Egyptian contingent was planned before the Security Council resolution that terminated the mission. But it is a step towards the complete withdrawal of MINUSMA by the 31st of December. In the coming weeks, peacekeepers from the Senegalese, Burkinabe, Ivorian, and Bangladeshi contingents will also leave as the outlying camps of Ugosugu, Gundam, Ber, and Menaka are closed. At a press conference in Juba today, the special representative of the Secretary General in South Sudan and head of the peacekeeping mission there, Nicholas Haysom, welcomed recent progress on the peace agreement, including the establishment of the government-led Joint Task Force for the Implementation of Constitution-Making and Electoral Processes and Parliament's consideration of the National Elections Act. However, Mr. Haysom warned that time is running out and critical decisions must be made urgently by political leaders if South Sudan is to meet the December 2024 election timeline. He also expressed concern about the impact of the Sudan crisis on South Sudan and condemned continuing intercommunal violence and cattle raiding. Mr. Haysom reiterated the UN's full support to the people of South Sudan and issued a call for urgent action to complete the transitional period of the peace agreement to create the foundation for peace and sustainable development. Turning to Sudan, 
The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs warns that hunger and displacement due to the ongoing war are spiraling out of control. More than 6 million people in Sudan, about 13% of the population, are now one step away from famine. This is according to the latest analysis today from the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, or IPC. Across the country, more than 20 million people are facing high levels of acute food insecurity. This is due to the conflict, economic decline, and mass displacement. And on that note, just to give you a sense of how many people continue to flee the violence in Sudan, more than 334,000 people have been internally displaced in just one week, according to the International Organization for Migration. IOM also tells us that since the war started, more than 3 million people have been displaced inside Sudan. Meanwhile, the UN Refugee Agency says that more than 855,000 people have fled to neighboring countries. Our peacekeeping colleagues in the Central African Republic tell us that the arrival of Chadian refugees in the border area with Chad in the northwest of the country continues to generate tensions, as well as additional pressure on an already dire humanitarian situation. UN peacekeepers have stepped up patrolling in the area and are supporting humanitarian actors who are assisting those in need. They've also established a security perimeter and provided medical treatment to civilians who sought protection at, the, at a nearby Minusca base following an attack by armed elements in Nana Bakasa in the Uham prefecture. The mission is continuing to patrol in the area, which is now calm. Peacekeepers are also conducting robust long-range patrols in Sam Unja and Unda Jale in the northeast in response to a tense security situation there. The presence of UN personnel has helped reassure the population to go about their daily activities. And we close today with thanks to our friends in Montevideo who have paid Uruguay's regular budget dues in full for this year. Uruguay becomes the 127th member state to pay up, and we say gracias to them. And that's it for me. Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, two questions. First, on um, Russian drone strikes uh, that have hit Ukrainian grain stores. Uh, does the Secretary General have any comment on that? And also on the grain issue, is there um, any update on possible talks between the parties to revive the Black Sea Grain Initiative? Uh, on the latter, uh, there's no update to share about any possible talks. We continue to reach out uh, at various levels uh, to make sure that uh, we can continue to do as much as possible uh, to get uh, Ukrainian and Russian uh, food and fertilizer uh, out to markets. Uh, but it is difficult, and it's made more difficult uh, by the first thing you asked about, which is to say attacks on ports. And of course, we're against uh, all attacks on civilian facilities. But uh, it, the Secretary General made it clear in his remarks uh, to you uh, the difficulties created by any uh, by anything that would impede uh, further work at our at the at the Ukrainian and other ports. Um, and but, but specifically on hitting a grain store that destroys um, thousands yeah. and thousands of tons of of grain. I exactly, and and one of the things that's discouraging is. Of course, this is food that the wider world will need, and we want to make sure that uh, food can go out to people. So we want any attacks on such facilities to be discouraged. Um, I, I had a second question um, on, the, um, on Niger. Mm -hmm. um, have there been any evacuations of UN uh, staff who are in Niger, and um, is there any update that you have on negotiations? Uh, there's, there's no real progress on uh, negotiations to share with you. As, as you know, Leonardo Santos Samao, our special envoy for West Africa and, and the Sahel, uh, talked to you, and he made clear that uh, today, in fact, uh, he is in Bamako. Uh, and he is traveling to all of the various uh, countries under his purview as soon as possible. Uh, but, uh, but there's no real progress on that front. Uh, as for UN personnel, we're, we're staying, uh, continuing to stay in the country. 
Teší? I'm surprised no one's asking questions. Uh, I have a couple of questions on China. Uh, I think one good story, one bad story. So let's start with the good one. Uh, the Chinese National Energy Administration uh, sh revealed data that for the first time ever in, in the history of China that the renewable energy electronic, uh, electricity gener gener uh, generating capacity past that of the coal. Uh, especially the first half year of this year, the, the wind and solar generation increased on a uh, year-on-year -year basis. It's like, it's 23.5%. What do you think that would contribute to the, um, to the long cold uh, climate sustainability? Uh, well, this is certainly uh, what the Secretary General wants all nations to pursue, and he is very pleased uh, by the nations that actually move ahead towards uh, using sustainable energy resources and move away uh, from coal, which uh, he has made clear has no future for humanity. So the bad story. Uh, for the past few days, because of the typhoon Duxuri, uh, in Beijing and metropolitan area there in, in China, they recorded, uh, they recorded a, a 140 years, f uh, the, the record-breaking pre precipitation of 140 years that led to 20 people died. Uh, 27 still not reached, and and more than more than 4,000 4, people if affected by this rain, heavy rain. Uh, what does the Secretary General has to say on on this incident? Uh, the Secretary General is saddened uh, by uh, the news that uh, so many people have uh, been killed uh, by the heavy rains in Beijing, and he hopes. Uh, that those who are missing will, uh, will be found safely. Uh, but certainly, uh, although there's no direct linkage we, we're making to climate change, the simple fact uh, that warmer weather leads to more intense weather events is, uh, is a large part of the problem we're facing all over the world. Which is why Farhan brings me to my third part. We saw more and more extreme climates like you just mentioned. Uh, can you remind us what would be the goal for the for the upcoming climate summit in September, and what do you what's your expectation for all the world leaders? Well, the Secretary General made clear uh, when he spoke to you about uh, about climate just uh, recently that this needs to be something where uh, all of those who show up show up with concrete uh, proposals. There have to be concrete steps and concrete action taken at the climate summit. Otherwise, there's, uh, there's no point uh, in, uh, in simply holding discussions. Uh, yes, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you. A few days ago, the Israeli court decided to evict uh, a whole village called Ras Jarraba in the Negev, which has 500 people to give room for the Jewish city of Dimuna to expand. So expelling the Bedouins from their homes to allow a Jewish settlement to expand. Do you have any comment on that? Isn't that apartheid also the second part of the question? Uh, I, although I won't characterize it uh, one way or another, we are against all expulsions, all uh, forced transfers of, uh, of uh, the Palestinian population and have made that clear in our regular reports uh, to the Security Council. Uh, Margaret Bashir. On Niger, you, first of all, you said the UNHAS flights are moving. So does that mean the airspace is open again? And you also referred to the transitional authorities. Who, who do you mean by the transitional authorities? Uh, we're, we're talking about wherever we go, whenever we need permissions in any area, we have to get permission from de facto authorities, even if they are not uh, f uh, uh, those whom we recognize as the government. As you know, we recognize the elected government. Uh, uh, right, and of you course, called uh, them transitional. You called them transitional authorities, as if you're transitioning... As if it's the coup leaders and, we're, so, and they're the transitional uh, government. Uh, uh, you didn't say de facto. Uh, uh, sorry, I misspoke then. Uh, it's, uh, I, uh, okay. they, they are the de facto authorities. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you and then Mario. 
Uh, hi, Farhan. Uh, my question is regarding to Black Sea deal. Uh, the question is, if uh, Russia doesn't come back to the deal, or is there will be any alternative way for the United Nations to send any humanitarian needs to countries who receive the grain or humanitarian needs from Ukraine? Uh, we are exploring all possible options to see what can be done uh, to make sure that uh, uh, Ukrainian grain, as well as Russian food and fertilizer, go to markets. And we're going to continue to work on that front. Uh, obviously, the, it would be easier if, if uh, that was accomplished within the framework of the Black Sea Initiative. But uh, we are, we're doing what we can uh, in, in, any, uh, in any alternative arrangements that we can come up with. Just following, what if it takes longer than expected? Uh, anything that takes more time will make it harder for people to get uh, food that they need. It will uh, contribute to a rise in world food prices and it will be worse overall for the population everywhere. So what we're doing, uh, trying to do is, uh, is uh, make sure that we can uh, get exports out as uh, quickly and efficiently as possible. Maria. Thanks, Farhan. The Security Council is voting this afternoon to expand the, the mandate of the mission in, in Colombia. I know there's not a final decision, but do you have any comment on the uh, additional functions that the government requested for the verification mission, namely to supervise the ceasefire with the ELN? Oh, uh, we are willing to uh, provide whatever functions uh, the Security Council uh, asks of us uh, when they meet later today, but, uh, but we'll await their decision. Uh, yes, Evelyn, you had a question? Yes, I did. Uh, the withdrawal of MINUSMA from Mali uh, is leaving hundreds and hundreds of local, of local people unemployed. Um, is there any remedy for that, or is the government looking at it? They, they, it's from Timbuktu all the way down to the capital. Uh, we are trying to see what can be done in terms of employment opportunities uh, for Malians through uh, the development work that we do. But ultimately, whenever UN uh, forces uh, leave any country, there is uh, an economic impact to that. And uh, that is an unavoidable uh, fact. But, uh, but we are uh, having to go along with this withdrawal in compliance uh, with the wishes of the Security Council and of the Malian authorities. Uh, yes, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bathili uh, of uh, Libya sounded uh, optimistic in his latest statement about the elections. And he said they, there was a meeting six plus six and they are agreeing on some schedule. Do you have update on what's going on in, with, on SMEAL in Libya? Well, uh, the, uh, the mission put out a, a statement from Mr. Bathali over the weekend, and I would just refer you to that. Uh, as we get further updates uh, from the mission, uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, share those with you as they come. And with that, over to you, Paulina.